Hey guys, welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. If my face seems a little bit puffy, my eyes seem a little bit red, <laughs> it's because I just got done listening to a podcast done by Jess from Roots and Refuge, and it was beautiful. It was wonderful. About nine times out of 10, she makes me cry, but in the best way. This was a podcast on loss, death and loss on the farm, which we have experienced quite a lot of, probably not more than the average person, but that doesn't mean that it's not really hard. And yesterday, one of my friends, uh, Letty, over at the Heavenly Homestead, she experienced a really hard loss. She's had a very rough kidding season, um, and I feel it. I feel it for her. So I'm gonna go ahead and link the podcast in the description box so you guys can listen to it whenever you feel like you are able to. It's about 40 minutes long, absolutely worth a listen. All of those podcasts are, but. I actually have to prepare a little bit for some cold weather. So our estimated last frost date actually moved. It used to be somewhere around the 19th of April here in Southwestern Kentucky. And I recently looked it up again and they had moved it, actually extended our season out a little bit to April 9th. However, <laughs> me and having a little bit of experience in this area, this will be our fifth gardening season here. I know that we have had frosts as late as May. May 5th, 2020, I'll never forget it. It was a very hard freeze. It was 27 or 28 degrees, which is a hard freeze. And I had so much in the garden. You see that? We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. They're starting to plant across the street. And sometimes that kind of messes with our plans too. So we've got frosts and we've got big old monocultures to deal with this time of year. So tonight we're gonna be getting some weather. It's not gonna be anything horrific, but it will be a cold front coming in. There's gonna be some probably decent winds. I'm gonna have to close up the greenhouse. I can't do that right now because I think it's 83 degrees out and you can't really close a greenhouse that there's plants in when it's that stinking hot out. It's just gonna make it unbearable in there. But I have planted a whole bunch of pots. I think there's 32 pots in each tray. And I really like this garden cart. It's gonna make it super easy to get all of these things into the greenhouse. So I keep checking the forecast and the low temperature, I haven't noticed it go below 35 degrees. So 35 degrees is not freezing, but if the conditions are right and the wind is still enough, you can absolutely get pockets of frost at that temperature. And certain plants like peppers especially, beans, they're really sensitive, squash, that can do some of those plants in for sure. Now the seedlings that I've got in my cart back here, these are all frost tender, so if they were up above the ground, they would probably be damaged if we experienced frost. But since these seedlings are still below the ground or the seeds haven't sprouted yet, they're probably not gonna get damaged and it would be fine to leave them out there. But there's something about low temperatures too. Sometimes low temperatures really don't aid in germination. A lot of warm weather things really like the soil temperature to be 50 degrees or above. So in order to kind of help maintain a warmer environment without a heat mat, don't have my heat mats outside. I don't have electricity out here in the greenhouse. I'm gonna wheel them in here. I've already wheeled them in here and they're gonna stay in here until they sprout and then beyond because some of these things are gonna go in the greenhouse here. I had talked about it in a previous video where I had a little bit of a less than ideal germination rate pretty consistently when starting things from seed in here. I think that there's a couple reasons for that. And definitely one of those reasons is things like slugs, other kinds of bugs like uh, roly polies and cutworms that really like to eat the tender leaves of very fresh seedlings. Look, it's 93 degrees in here. And that's with all of the ventilation options wide open with the fans going. I haven't put the shade cloth over the greenhouse yet, but that's absolutely on the agenda in the very, very near future. So I actually have some seedlings over here that, oh, some of them look good. And we'll talk about why some of them look really good, but most of them really don't look good. I really want to be able to get them in the ground ASAP. I think they're going through some kind of like nutrient deficiency. They just aren't a nice deep green. They're not growing as well as I think they should. They just look kind of anemic. This plant here is the same age as this plant here. 
This is a plant that I started myself. It's a chocolate pear tomato seed. It looks horrible. This seedling is probably six weeks old and so is this one. This one looks a lot more like a six week old seedling should and this was actually a volunteer plant that my daughter pulled out of her garden and she potted this up with some of the soil in her garden. This was actually potting soil that I bought this year that I'm never gonna buy again. Um, Stay Green brand, S-T-A Green garden soil. And I mix my garden soil with perlite or vermiculite to make it a suitable potting soil. Otherwise, garden soil is a little bit heavy and it doesn't allow roots to really get as deeply as they really need to get, especially little seedlings. And it can cause compaction in little pots like this. So in order to combat that, I do the perlite, but there should be nutrition in that soil. It actually says in the bag that it feeds your feeds your plants for up to three months. Well, it fed it for probably about three days and then quit. This is what we're really looking for. And so a lot of our stuff is going to be a little bit stunted. But as soon as I can get this stuff in the garden after the threat of frost has passed, we should see a really great boost in these plants. I was actually thinking about it earlier. One of these years, I genuinely might only grow our perennials and volunteer plants and see what we get out of it. I feel like I need a decent amount of freezer stuff and stuff that's put away in cans and things in order to be comfortable not growing intentionally uh, some different varieties of things, but I think it could be a really fun thing to do one year. We get a lot of volunteer plants and if you're not sure what that is, it's basically a plant that grows from seed that dropped last year. We usually get a whole bunch of volunteer tomato plants every year and we get volunteer squash. I've gotten volunteer lettuces this year. Most of that is in the raised bed garden and we'll go ahead and check that out. Right now, what's growing in the greenhouse is those few little plants that did happen to germinate, a couple squashes, some lima beans, but I've got a lot of weeds and I am slowly working on the weed situation, but I've been having a problem with my arm. My elbow isn't tolerating all of the work that I ask it to do, especially in the busy time of year. So I've made a rule with myself, every time I enter the greenhouse and every time I enter another garden space, like the raised bed garden, I am going to pick three weeds. So before we get out of here, I've got to pick three so that I can hopefully stay on top of it and not have a whole bunch to do at once, but we'll see. <laughs> There's actually a volunteer tomato or two coming up in the green stock. I had quite the amazing volunteer tomato over here last year. It was a yellow currant tomato. I'm going to say that that's probably what that is. And this here is actually not a volunteer plant. This, I believe, is a cabbage that I planted at the end of last year, intending to try to get some brassicas out of the greenhouse this past fall. And we had that really hard freeze in December, super hard freeze in December that killed literally everything in the greenhouse except for one strawberry plant and that thing. So it did die back a little bit, but it started to really come back a couple months after it had originally died. And it's putting out a lot of little leaves. It's probably not gonna form a head, but those leaves are absolutely edible. I say that and usually they're not super edible or palatable when it's been hot outside because they get kind of bitter. It was kind of tough, but it's not bitter. <laughs> I lied. It's a little bit bitter on the aftertaste, but it's nothing that a good helping of ranch can't fix. So I'll probably put that in a salad this week. Hi, handsome. How are you? You guys have messy faces. Yes, you do. So in the garden, in the raised bed garden here and talking about the monoculture, we live really close to many large fields of monocultures. Near us, they grow soy, corn, and tobacco as well as winter wheat. And you can hear the wind blowing today. It's just part of springtime. The wind is blowing in a good direction today and the other day when they came with the sprayers and were spraying Roundup in the field across the street from me, the wind was also blowing in a positive direction. Sometimes the wind blows in the wrong direction and it blows straight onto my raised bed garden here and we can experience widespread damage on most things. It doesn't kill everything, but obviously it's, it's not nice. It's not a good thing. It's not something I want on my plants. I've even had the spray of Roundup ruin 
the leaves on some very tender leaves of the trees that we have growing here, our elderberry and some of our pear trees. And that's never a fun thing. So what I did to combat that this year, I actually bought two different sprinklers and I said to myself, as soon as I see the sprayer coming, I'm gonna turn on the sprinklers, hoping to kind of knock that out of the air before it had a chance to blow over. And I think the wind direction really saved us this year anyway, but it was just a thought and I think that it maybe did make a little bit of a difference or it could make a little bit of a difference in the future. Cause really it's been a couple days and it doesn't look like anything has been affected we will see little shriveled up blotches and burns and none of this looks affected I need to come through here and cut off some of these little broccoli florets this is about all I'm getting out of these plants this year which is super common for me and that's really sweet no bitter aftertaste look at this native pollinator isn't she pretty See, I'm not entirely sure that this is or isn't Roundup related. We've got some shrivelly leaves on this elderberry. This is the side of the elderberry that is closest to that field. And when the wind is blowing and I've got the sprinklers on, the sprinklers have a hard time reaching out this far. So it wouldn't be surprising to me if that is damage from the Roundup. And I think we'll be able to tell that in a few weeks when the new growth comes in, you'll see like a clear line of when or where the Roundup sprayed through and then the recovery after that. If it's disease, it would probably still continue on. And I don't know, this is very classic for what we experience, unfortunately, almost every year. This rhubarb is getting ready to flower. Isn't that gorgeous? We actually had a rhubarb plant flower last year too, and they smell really lovely. And I did a little bit of research at that point and I wondered, you know, is my plant gonna die? Is this a death bloom? I know that some plants, especially succulents, when they bloom out the middle, it means that the plant is gonna die. It doesn't mean that in this case, you might get a fewer stalks in the years that the rhubarb decides to flower, but you can still harvest from it. It still tastes great. You just might get fewer stalks on those years, which is fine. A couple of our cabbage plants have gone and flowered, so we're going to be collecting seed from these. I can't really remember the name of this cabbage, but it has done very well for us in the past. I'll put the name across the screen here. I am running out of seed, and this is an heirloom variety, so I look forward to collecting those seeds. And I will have probably way too many of them, and when I do package them up, I'll put some on the website. On the subject of volunteer plants, this is actually cilantro. So I had a big cilantro plant here last year. It flowered and went to seed. And now there's one, two, three, four, five, six cilantro plants right here. Cilantro really likes to bolt in the heat. So I imagine that it's gonna flower soon. It'll put up a middle stalk and flower and the pollinators really love cilantro plants. So we're just gonna let it do its thing. Our chives are blooming. Clearly the pollinators love this as well. So we've had this chive plant here for, this is its fifth season. I put this in our first year that we had this homestead and it gets more and more blooms on it every year. And one of the things I like to do with it, and I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. Some of these are still kind of closed up and I want to leave some for the pollinators as well. But you can pluck these little chive blossoms off and put them in some vinegar. So last year I used both white vinegar and I used red wine vinegar to make the chive blossom vinegar. I let it steep for I think it was five weeks and then strained it out and it makes the best vinegar for an oil and vinegar dressing for salads. I guess while I'm here I will pick my three weeds for stepping in this space. One, here's a weed, here's a good one. People have asked me before, this is also my asparagus bed, what do you do to get crabgrass out of your asparagus patch and where you won't affect the asparagus crown and I don't have a good answer for that. See, I'm having a hard time with crabgrass right now. All I do is hand pick. I hand pick the crabgrass out and it's basically a never ending battle. Um, but if you can do what you can just to keep the grass as down or as, look at this, 
And you can do what you can to keep the grass from really taking over. And eventually, when the summer goes on, the fronds of the asparagus will open up and shade out the grass and you'll have to do a lot less work later on in the season. But for now, I just, I just pick it out, do what I can. Usually when I am here picking my three weeds, I end up picking way more than three, which is good. It's, it's developing a really good habit in me. But again, it's, it's hurting my arm. I need to pick weeds with my left hand. Some more of that grass. I actually just noticed some baby chives coming up here. This probably came from seed that spilled last year, which is totally fine. Another volunteer in our garden is this volunteer lettuce that was from seed that fell here last year. Over here I've got a little itty bitty radish patch and I do know that I've had some cutworm issues in this space but I also have a sneaking suspicion that I've had some children come by and eat some radishes um, because I had some that were really well developed right here and there's no sign of them and my kids really love radishes. They have radishes growing in their garden and we'll check their garden out in a little bit but you know sometimes a good radish is just hard to resist. This one's cool, it's almost two-headed. Neat little thing. Here's a real big one. Look at that. This one has a little bit of a split on the bottom, which does tend to happen when they get a little bit older. When I first started growing radishes, I read that you should really only take them out the number of days that it says on the packet and no more, or else you risk them being woody. And I'd say maybe in a really long growing season, like we have in the heat of the summer, when the days are really long, that that could be the case. But in general, you can get a radish from seed to harvest in about 25 days in ideal conditions, but that's if the temperature is right, that's if the soil moisture is right, that's if the nutrition is right, and if the amount of sun is correct for the plant. So don't necessarily make that a hard and fast rule. I have found that even if the radish is a tiny bit woody, you can roast it and they come out nice and tender. And roasted radishes tend to lose that kind of spicy flavor that a lot of radishes can have, especially when they're grown in a little bit of heat. They can have a little bit more of that like spiciness and roasting really helps take that away. And from what I hear, fermenting does too. So what I plan to do or what I hope to do with at least one of these radishes, maybe the kids will do it in their garden, is to let that bolt and go to seed. The little radish pods that come up from pollination of those flowers are just amazing. And you actually get more food out of one radish when you let it bolt and get those little seed pods on it than you get just from one little radish. So if you live in a hot climate and you really want to grow radishes and you like that radish type flavor, try letting it go to seed, letting the pollination pollinators benefit from that plant and then collecting the seed pods. They're really good in salad. They're really good just kind of like dipped in ranch. And it really is the best way to get the most out of a radish plant. For now, I'm gonna put these inside. It is kind of hot out here, like I said. If I leave these out, the roots will start to shrivel and wilt and I don't want that. So our kids have a beautiful big garden over here that they get to manage and I didn't put weed fabric in this space last year and I really regretted it. I had weed fabric in the year prior and it really helps maintain the weed situation. In the early spring the weeds are a little bit easier to manage than in the dead of summer when the harvest is getting really heavy and the weed fabric really helps the kids maintain their own garden. It helps me maintain my garden. I really like the idea um, of gardening with just mulch and mulching deeply and all that. It just doesn't work well here. It's not super practical here. We can't actually access or get access to big old, you know, dump trucks worth of mulch that hasn't been sprayed. Again, we're in the middle of agricultural farmland and something that isn't sprayed or hasn't been sprayed is very hard to come by. And when you can find it, they don't deliver out here in the boonies. So we do what we can and weed fabric just works for us. <laughs> so in this part of the kids garden, they have all these radishes right here. They have some onions where I had extra red onions that I let them pop in the ground there. They actually picked these little garlic bulbs, these little yard garlic out of the lawn and stuck them in the tire. I thought that was really cute. And then they found these volunteer lettuces in my garden and transplanted them over here. Mm. 
So we're out in the goat pasture now, the big one that all of my girl dairy goats are in, my does. And you can see a little bit of green popping up over there. It did look greener about a week ago. We haven't had rain in a little bit, but again, we're getting some tonight and I'm super grateful for that. The pastures have grown enough though, where I have stopped feeding hay for the season. Most of the longer grass and browse is out there in that big section by our pond. But right now the girls are over here. Why don't you go drink some water? Come on, Calamity. Come on. I've been asked before, do your goats ever pant like a dog? Yes, they do. They do when it's hot. Calamity is pregnant. She's due in about a month. And I see it most often in the bigger goats and goats that don't have horns. So goats' horns are designed to allow heat to escape. There's a huge blood vessel inside the horn. And when the horn is outside the body, it's able to release that heat and help cool the goat down. Are you all right? But if they get hot enough, they will pant. It's not necessarily a bad thing. They're just cooling down like a dog would. You don't want it to be excessive. You don't want there to be any kind of drooling, but clearly she's not in distress. She really wants to eat. Look at this udder coming in on Calamity, guys. Look at it. It's so pretty. Oh, I can't wait. So May 13th is her due date. April 28th is Talia's due date. So she's coming up next. She's looking pretty good. And then May 12th is Elpis's due date. She is quite large in all the right places. <laughs> so you see what's happening over there with Mochi? Mochi's the tan and white one. He's been really acting very bucky for his age. He's acted very bucky since the day he was born. He's seven weeks old right now, which honestly, it's a little early for weaning, but I honestly might take him out of here just so we don't risk any unwanted pregnancies. You can hear him acting like a bug. Come here. Get your last drink. Get your last drink. Come here. Oh, he's running for me. Mochi. I got him. So I'm actually going to remove him from the area at seven weeks old. It's a little early for weaning, but He's been a single baby getting as much milk as he wants and a good weaning weight for Nigerian dwarves is 20 pounds. I am very sure that he's there. You're huge. <laughs> See how big he is? He's just too much of a nuisance in here. So I do plan on keeping Mochi back as a weather. Even though he may technically be um, essentially old enough to wean from his mama, no, Titus. He's trying to scratch his little skirts on you. Nope. I might not be able to sit in here. This might be a bad time. It's a bad time. So even though he is able to be weaned because of his weight, he's not able to be castrated right now. Um, I really want, oh my gosh. Okay, I'll stand. I gotta stand up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
even though he's big, his urethra and all that probably isn't developed enough to put a band on him right now. So I would like him to be at least eight weeks old. And out here with the boys, I genuinely might be able to take him out longer. It's great if you can let a male goat get to be about 16 weeks or four months old before you band him. It just makes sure that everything is well developed down there. And when you band them at that age, they have a lot less um, of a likelihood of having a narrowing of their urethra, which means that they have a lot less likely incidence of getting urinary calculi in the future. So goats can be prone to getting basically bladder stones. And with male goats, their urethra is so long that sometimes the stones aren't able to make it out of the urethra and they can get a very serious blockage and die. So you can give the babies the benefit of the doubt of being at least eight weeks old, ideally around 16 weeks old before you castrate them, that's the best. And out here, when he's away from the girls, that very well could be possible for him. So even though he's young, he's not particularly little, and I do worry that he could, in the very near future, be able to accidentally breed anyone in the barn. I mean, Pepper, she's quite short, and I bet you if he was determined enough and she was I guess eager enough that they could make it happen. And I especially don't want any of the really little girls to become bred for them. At this age, it would be a death sentence. Little goats, boys and girls can be fertile and able to breed as young as eight weeks old. So I feel most comfortable taking him out of the situation because he seems super eager to breed. He's never seen a chicken before. What is that, Mochi? He's actually talking back and forth with Odie, which I don't think he knows, but Odie is his dad. So mama and baby will be a little bit upset for a couple days. She doesn't seem to be calling for him at all. It's just daddy. And he'll be a little sad for a few days, but he'll get used to the situation and he's gonna be just fine, I promise. I am going to be doing the garden tours like I did last year, every week. I'm not exactly sure when I'm gonna start them, but it should be relatively soon, probably sometime in May. So if you haven't yet, please subscribe and stick around. Those garden tours are a really good time. Ooh.